the topic today is World War I and the Russian Revolution of 1917. So in 1913, uh, there was a 300th anniversary of the House of Romanov a dynasty in Russia. And they were very proud of this, that it was celebrations, banquets, fireworks. It was 300 years of one dynasty in Russia from the times of trouble. And it looked like Russia was doing really well. It looked like it was stable. It, it was developing democracy. It had a parliament. It had political parties. It had opposition, a real one, a communist one. It had freedom of the press. As I said, Pravda, the newspaper of the communists, the Bolsheviks was coming out. It had liberal intelligentsia, which were constitutional democrats. They had the in industry that was pretty much catching up with uh, Germany. It had a czar who was a patriot, who was uh, Orthodox, who was uh, not a, a Europeanized bureaucrat like his predecessors, it looked like everything was fine. And it would be almost unimaginable to think that a few years later, the whole thing is going to collapse. It's going to be overthrown in the most bloody, the most vicious revolution, uh, as Russia would lose millions in this uh, communist experiment. So were there any clouds? on the horizon. No, there were. One thing is that this stratification of peasantry led to a strange situation that a country that exported grain, that was fairly good in agriculture, it had this super rich and super poor peasants because they were overcrowded because of what I told you, having more sons all the time. And at the same time, there were some really rich ones who produced grain for the market and it was not unusual for a Russian peasant uh, to actually ask, what is the price of grain in Chicago? Because that was the, where the prices of grain worldwide were made, because they were exporting grain to Odessa and from there the world over. Another possibly potential problem was with too many workers, as I said, in concentrated in too many places, too many too, too few places, which potentially was a, a problem. But none of that really seemed like a real problem. I mean, if you compare to the problems of others at the time, if you compare to the poverty of southern Italy or to the working class conditions in, in, in Britain, I mean, Russia was not really that far worse off uh, compared to the others. So, you know, basically, I'm among those who feel that if it was not for World War I, the disaster may not have happened. So what is it that happened in World War I that brought all this calamity? So let's go over it one by one. As you know, Russia got involved in World War I because of several things. Number one, pride, weak leadership of Nicholas, uh, nationalism that demanded uh, unambiguous support for Serbia, no matter what. Uh, but most importantly, I think it was the reward, the reward that Russia was promised. And a very few people remember, but it's important. In case of victory, Russia was promised Constantinople. This has been the dream of Russia for 500 years. This has been something that you, she, she was denied in the Crimean War. The British and the French went to war to stop Russian expansion to the south and not, not only not to have Constantinople, but to allow Russian ships in the Mediterranean. Now the situation has changed, which is a dream of Russian uh, czars for centuries. If we win the war, we're going to get Constantinople. Russia really will become the third Rome. Uh, and that was a, really a pretty serious incitement. What also is important, though, when Russia entered the war, it had the biggest, already at that time, it had the biggest army ever assembled in one place in history. It was about three times bigger than the French army, which was over a million. The British expeditionary force was 300,000. There's no big deal. The Germans had a pretty big army because they had to do the Eastern Front and the Western Front. But Russians had three million when they began. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And by 1917, you wouldn't believe it, it was over 10 million soldiers, including everybody in uniform, including railroads, including 
uh, garrisons in the rear, including the wounded and the replaced. It was like 10 million people that went through the ranks, which was the biggest army ever in world history. Russia had a biggest front. The front extended from the Baltics to the Black Sea. It was several times bigger than the French one. Uh, the French one was really relatively short from, from Alsace to, to the North Sea. Uh, so in a sense, Russia had a huge burden that they had to face in World War I. Now the war begins pretty badly for Russia, and this seems to be like an omen of things to come that would be worse. Um, it, it's called the East Prussian Campaign or the Battle of Tannenberg, uh, which is a small town in East Prussia. In a nutshell, it's a disaster for the Russians uh, and uh, partly it's a genius of uh, Colonel Ludendorff who made his name in this campaign and it would be promoted later on to be the chief of the general staff of the German army together with his imbecile superior Hindendorf who really didn't do much what was going on, but he was the official commander and all the credit went to him. And he was later elected president of the German Republic because of the victories in the Eastern Front that were really the credit of Ludendorff. So what did they do? In a nutshell, it's very simple. The Russians had a plan, just like the Germans, and they, since the Germans were busy with the French, because the German plan called for attacking the French first, they attacked first immediately. Uh, on the Eastern uh, Front in East Prussia, and the, the objective was Königsberg, which is today known as Kaliningrad. Uh, and they were doing very well. At, at some point, the, uh, the German command considered withdrawing from East Prussia and abandoning Königsberg to the Russians. So quickly the Russians moved. But then comes Ludendorff with his master plan. Ludendorff is probably one of the most talented generals of World War I of all armies, basically. But his move was to uh, deceive the Russians uh, by quick movement of troops. Uh, the area was about 200 kilometers. He would actually, he would, he would bring the troops, they would open fire, and then they would be put on the trains and go to the other front and open fire. And the Russians would actually think that there were many more troops than actually there were. Uh, and then uh, they, uh, by this deception, they stopped the Russian advance. And then they uh, uh, essentially defeated two Russian armies coming from the west uh, and from the south, one by one. Uh, and the Russian general Samsonov committed suicide. And the Russian casualties in lost and wounded in a matter of two or three weeks of battle were astronomical 90,000. So they lost close to 100,000 men in the first weeks of the war without winning anything at all. So that was, that was the, uh, the sign of things to come. 90,000, 90, 90,000, close to 100,000. <coughs> so the entire year of 1915 uh, is, is retreat. Russia is slowly retreating from Poland. As you know, the borders of the Russian Empire were not what they are now, or even what they were in the Soviet Union days. It was all of Poland, pretty much, was a, a Russian Empire. And they had slowly squeezed out. The entire 1915, they're retreating, and the Germans are advancing and taking over most of Poland. By the end of 1915, it's pretty much all of Poland and Lithuania uh, is moved. Uh, the, the front is moving to the uh, east. And at this point, uh, in 1916, there are heavy battles. As you recall, 1916 is Verdun and Somme, and hundreds of thousands of men are being slaughtered in France, and the French are pleading the Russians, start the offensive, do something to, to uh, alleviate the pressure on the Western Front. And the Russians do. And this is June 2016. Uh, which is called the Brusilov Offensive. Brusilov, B-R-U-S-I-L-O-V, Brusilov Offensive. So it's in the south, in Ukraine, and it's against Austria-Hungary. And uh, it is known in military history as uh, a success 
Uh, Brusilov offensive destroyed uh, an Austro-Hungarian army. They took 400,000 prisoners of war. 400,000 prisoners of war. And I don't know exactly, but at least at least two or three hundred thousand dead on the Austrian side. But the casualties on the Russian side, 500,000 dead, killed in action. So some people call it a ferric victory, or some other general said, with victories like this, we're gonna run out of the army soon, because these are astronomical casualties, comparable to Verdun, and Verdun is, you know, 500,000 died. I think 500,000 Germans and 400,000 French, close to a million people in Verdun, and it was similar in the Brusilov offensive. So-called Russian victory, in a sense, they moved the front to the west. They approached what today is considered Western Ukraine. At that time, it was already Hungarian, uh, Austro-Hungarian territory, but uh, that's pretty much where it fizzled out and it stopped. Now, what it showed, 1916 showed to both sides, both on the Western Front and on the Russian Front, that this slaughter is just exhausting all countries to a point of collapse. Uh, and it was not just the Russians. The French were pretty close to collapse. They basically decided not to do any more big offenses after they're done. The British pretty much were defeated in Somme and they pretty much didn't do anything for the rest of the war in terms of big operations. The German army was slowly exhausting itself and, and there will be rebellions uh, somewhat later, two years later. So the Russian army was not you know, the worst. It was the biggest and it had to cover the biggest front and it suffered just on the same scale of casualties as on the Western Front. Now, by the end of 1916, things were beginning to look pretty gloomy. The war was clearly unwinnable. It was, it was virtually impossible to think you could win it militarily after the Brusilov Offensive, the so-called victory against a weaker enemy, Austria-Hungary. Uh, if, if they couldn't win against a decisive victory with breaking to Budapest in the south, then there was no way they could win anything against the Germans in the north. So it was clear to the ruling elite the war was unwinnable. Uh, it was a continued slaughter that only strained the country beyond any reasonable uh, measure. And it's at this point, at the end of 1916, that you have to you, you begin over conversations of regime change. Uh, it was the beginning of a critique of uh, Nicholas II not by the masses, no, they, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, they're, they're bearing the, the brunt. No, the aristocracy. There is a conversations going on, but not yet of removing Nicholas. What they want to do is remove Rasputin. And this is perhaps one of the most notorious and well-known pages of Russian history. So who is Rasputin? He's a monk and he had miracle powers maybe not miracle, but some definitely medicinal powers that are still not been explained by, uh, by modern science. What he could do, he could stop the bleeding. And it was very important because the Tsarevich, the, the only male heir of Nicholas, his name was Alexei, he was 10. He had this incurable disease, which is called hemophibia, hem hemophilia, which is, he inherited from his mother, which basically means if you have a bruise, you bleed to death. And if you have an open wound, you bleed to death too. But it's, you, the blood wouldn't curl, it would stop. And Rasputin could stop the bleeding. And so there was a, a moment when Rasputin was in Siberia and the Tsarevich fell and, and, and the, Alexandra, the, the Tsarina, the, the, the queen, she was terrified that her son is going to die and they called him on the phone and they brought the phone through a long cord to the woods in Siberia and he started talking and the, and, and, and the woods stopped bleeding. It's absolutely amazing. Just, just his voice. Amazing. So 
So because of this capacity, she, she, the guy had a complete power over the queen. She would do anything to please him and do whatever he wanted. He was, he was um, not a very good person. He would take bribes. He would sleep with women. At one point, he raped a, a, a countess and nobody could do anything. Nobody could say anything because he had his power over the Tsarina and it was a disaster. So finally, they decided to kill him. It was a conspiracy of aristocracy against Rasputin uh, by Count Yusupov and higher ranks of aristocracy. It was the richest of the rich, the highest circles of St. Petersburg society. The way they would put it was like this. To, they need to free the Tsar from the power of the dark forces. And the dark forces was Rasputin and the queen, the Tsarina, because she is German. And in that sense, the hostility to her was very similar to hostility to Marie Antoinette uh, in the French Revolution. She was suspected of being disloyal and passing messages to the Germans. All that is total nonsense. She didn't pass messages to anybody and she was totally loyal to her husband and to her family. But Russia was at war with Germany and she was German and she was not trusted. And especially because her protege, Rasputin, did all these horrible things uh, with bribery and corruption and stuff. Anyway, in December 2000, excuse me, 1916, they killed him. And there's a movies about him, how they would drown him and shoot him and strangle him and the guy just wouldn't die. And, and it's all very dramatic. There's several document movies made about this dramatic story, but they finally did kill him. That is the beginning of the revolution because the killing of Rasputin is a sign that the aristocracy is turning against the Tsar. And that was very important because the, the Tsar fell not because of the popular revolution. The Tsar fell because the aristocracy decided to save the monarchy by removing Nicholas. This is how they would put it. Save the monarchy and Russia by removing incapable Tsar. That's how they presented it later on.